when I, when I think of what I want this documentary to be about, it's the same I feel about my art. It's the same I feel about anything I do in life. When, when you, if you try and make something happen, it, it causes conflict. Because it, 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 you're trying to force something. It, regardless of whether or not you try and make something happen, a, a thing's going to take shape on its own. It's, it's going to become its own thing. Regardless of the effort you put into it, regardless of, of the direction that you have for it in mind, and that's one thing you always have to remember when you're working on art, is that things take their own shape, and you have to be willing to shift and move with them. It's like water, man. Like, when, when you see water, I mean, it, it just falls out of the sky, and it hits, and it goes wherever is the easiest, the path of least resistance. And it carves out canyons, and it makes lakes, but it's never trying to do anything, and it's, that's something I try and think about in, in regard to everything when I'm working when I'm teaching. All right, my name is Jacob Hoslocker. I uh, am the founding director of the LH Project out here in Joseph, Oregon. What people can walk away with here is not just a sense of intimacy, but a sense of privacy and, and quiet. And I think that quietness really opens up minds and people can delve into their ideas of what they're making or want to work and they have a real clear opportunity to discover that because of where they are here out in, out in the sticks of Eastern Oregon. We've been doing this veteran session now at the LH for, this is the third year. And it's something that was conceived probably like generations ago. My dad was captured in, in uh, Belgium by Polish troops and they didn't have, en have enough uh, places on the trucks for the prisoners and they shot every other guy in the back of the head and then loaded my dad up and the uh, the trucks of the rest of his, his uh, division. Um, he didn't talk about that much, and I didn't really understand, but hearing these stories and experiencing firsthand accounts from my generation of these vets that are coming out here really is important for me. I think it's also just the commitment that they have for the artwork that not just tells stories, it puts their, their hearts and their souls out there in ways that other artists are trying to, and a lot of them really succeed at it, but I'm just, not just me, but I think everybody is moved in ways that they didn't know they could be moved by, by the artwork that the veterans are, are making. So I started the Dirty Canteen a, a few years ago with hopes that I can bring uh, a community of, of, of artists who are veterans together. Not all of us have the same views on, on politics or, or war. Uh, obviously, I, I, I did not go to Iraq or Afghanistan, so I don't have that experience. And the similarities are, are that we are veterans and that we are artists. But I think that camaraderie that we had in the military still comes through in this group. And, and we still are all in this view of trying to make the world a better place, trying to use our art to instigate conversations about topics that are important, not only to veterans, but to, to society as a whole.
If it keeps on raining, leaven's going to break. And the water gonna come and I have no place to stay. Well, all that night I sat on the lever and moan. Well, all that night I sat on the lever and moan. Thinking about my baby and my happy own. If it keeps on raining, leaven's going to break. If it keeps on raining, leaven's going to break. And all these people have no place to stay. Now look here, mama, what am I to do? Now look here, mama, what am I to do? I ain't got nobody to come on trouble to. I work on the left, mama, both night and day. I work on the left, mama, both night and day. Creating art for me, uh, it's something to look forward to. It's a time that just to get lost in the studio, working with your hands, it, it grounds me, whether it's drawing, painting, carving, working in clay. And it's a chance to really take some of the stuff that's in my head and get it out there. I mean, a lot of times it can be like a scream. It can be a way to really express things that, I can't express in another way and, you know, not get thrown in jail. So, and it's, it's something to look forward to. And from that, it's really grown like something that's great about ceramics is that like the community is something that's like a buzzword now, but it's a really authentic thing in ceramics because to load and fire a big kiln, kiln is a real powerful resource and so it kind of brings people together and that's happened over and over again and now it's it's happened in the time when you know being a veteran in itself a combat veteran can be really lonely and being an artist can be really lonely in in, in that in the in their own regards and then you're a, a combat veteran and an artist and that can get really isolating it can get really hard on your head and so coming together and hanging out and having that ongoing conversation, maybe you see a friend once a year, hopefully more than that, but, but there's that rapport that's going on that when you get together and make work, it's really a powerful thing to look forward to that's coming up on the short, short distance in the, in the near horizon. And so that's a really powerful thing. When I'm in my studio, there's, there's, there's parts of it I look forward to. The same reason as I look, I look forward to long road trips is, is listening to audiobooks. I listen to a lot of audiobooks when I'm in my studio. I look, I look forward to finding good new books to just sort of plug in and, and start getting to work on something. And at the same time, I can be, I can be learning about something or listening to something while I'm, because a lot of the work I make is really monotonous, rep, repetition sort of and I like the work to read is that way like I always work in multiples whatever I do there's always multiples of something whether it be the image or the object or the canvas and be, and that that for me is reflective of the repetition of this all of this shit that we do you know even if it's if it's dating if it's trying to find someone you want to be with if it's a job I mean you're trying to do something you think is going to leave a mark you you want every I remember <laughs> this really cheesy uh, we all had to do senior quotes in our yearbooks, right? And mine was, I don't know why I picked this, because I, I was like 18, but each life makes its own imitation of immortality, right? And uh, we're all trying to do that in some way. But I look forward to getting into my studio, making work. What's the fucking question? <laughs> I'm gonna put that in there. <laughs> I'm inspired to create these works by by knowing that there are voices out there that aren't heard, um, like like those with the grenade series of, of the stories that I'm that have been shared with me by other veterans, you know they they their voices aren't typically heard uh, by the masses or by people, and I think it's very important to share them and and share these experiences so that people can understand that 
that that suffering that that these soldiers go through when they come home from from combat. So I put a voice to the to the voiceless in in my work, and that inspires me to continue to do so. So there's this this thought or this this idea going around, and I see it often that art is healing, and and arts heal pain, and arts. Uh, you know, will heal soldiers. And you know what? It very may, may well for, for some of them. But for me, making art doesn't heal shit. I've been making art since 2010. I'm not healed. I still suffer from depression. I still suffer from anxiety. Um, therapy and my meds are, are what, what's going to help me. The art doesn't help anything. What it does do is offer a cathartic experience, a release of some sort, uh, just for a moment. You know, uh, I can I can think about something that I want to make, and I can let it out on that art piece. But it, that thought never goes away. By making it, it hasn't healed anything inside me. It just it, it's just another form of release. It just as a you know, punching a, a speed bag or. or or, or hitting a baseball or anything else would. It doesn't heal shit, it just gives you a release. All I saw was dead, blown apart Americans. That's all I saw when I was in Iraq. I never saw somebody pull the fucking trigger against. But that distance, and I can still see those, I can still see those guys and hear them screaming. I remember, I remember one instance, and this is a story I tell a lot, because I guess it was, this was really the one moment, I mean, this, is, this was the event that I was awarded my combat action badge for, and it was the event that really brought into focus my own mortality. I mean, my whole life, you know, I'm, I'm rock climbing, jumping off cliffs, jumping off bridges, and we would just see if we could find the, the tallest bridge we could ever jump off of, and I think we got up to like 70 feet or something, right? And it isn't anything I do now, but we were driving, it was the 4th of July, and we were told to be really aware of what we were doing, because they knew that this was an important holiday for Americans, and that the possibility of attack or threat was high. And so, it was, God, it was, this is one of the worst missions we ever had. And we're leaving Cedar too. This is southern Iraq, I believe. And we're heading up to Scania, and through Scania, we're going to go to Anaconda. And it's night, it's 12 o'clock in the morning, and uh, me and my co-driver were listening to the presidents of the United States. We're listening to Peaches. And then uh, I remember right as this song is playing, you get so complacent. And we're just driving along in these trucks, and out of nowhere, uh, this red tracer round just snaps right in my window, right through the front of my face and out the other window. And before you know what's happened and the radio just blows up, contact left, and, and your co-pilot puts, and we trained exhaustively, and, and it just becomes reflex. He puts my weapon in the crook of my arm, I'm driving the truck, and I grab the pistol grip, and I just start returning fire, and I'm aiming with my elbow, and I'm looking out the window and seeing where these tracer rounds are coming from, and it, it isn't like you can aim, right? I mean, it's just suppressive fire which <laughs> I have some friends at home that tell me it's not suppressive fire, it's indiscriminate fire, <laughs> which I think is, is pretty funny, the civilian's idea of euphemisms. But. And then we just drove through. And it was over as soon as it, it started. And we stopped at Scania right before we went into the base. And we're looking at all the trucks because we had to plug all these, tr these holes up before we go in into this. Uh, it's just like it's a really small little, just a stop. You can sleep there. And uh, there's just fuel is pissing out of all these tankers. You know, somebody peed their pants in one of the trucks. And this is the first time we'd ever got attacked. And it was, it was just a blink of an eye and then it was over. But it's something that, you know, in relation to, I have a really good friend, a grad, another grad that I work with, uh, Xander, had lymphoma, had cancer, and he beat it. And he put this in terms that, that is something that I put this in the same terms as, is that you're really on bonus time now. And that's the way that that even affected me. It, you, it brings your mortality into such focus that it's like, I could have died right there. And everything after that, you don't really care about it. <laughs> You don't, you don't care how it goes, and so you just do it. You know, I just I make art now, and 
It doesn't matter if I get famous. It doesn't matter if I sell it. It just, it's important to me to use my art to help others maintain an awareness of what I think I need to maintain an awareness of in my own life. I'm gonna eat a lot of peaches I'm moving to the country I'm gonna eat me a lot of peaches I'm moving to the country I'm gonna eat a lot of peaches I'm moving to the country I'm gonna eat a lot of peaches Peaches come from a can They were put there by a man So this year at LH, I'm working on a series of works that involves a, a, a symbol that, that most people are familiar with. Maybe not civilians so much as military, but I want to introduce this symbol to them in, in a way, and it's the symbol of a target. And what, what I've done is uh, I cut out uh, uh, styrofoam blocks to build the shape of the target form. And each individual piece was then molded in plaster. From there, I slip cast each piece, meaning that I pour porcelain slip inside of the ceramic mold. I wait approximately 15 minutes or 20 minutes until I pour the slip out of the mold, leaving a hollow shell of that particular piece that, that becomes part of this whole sculpture. I did, I did so so that I can, when you're aiming at a target, there's different grids that you're looking at. Center mass, head shot, shoulder shots, abdominal shot. So I want to separate those grids, and by doing so, I made these pieces separate that would, would accentuate that, that aspect of the target. I then begin to um, slip and score each individual piece and build them together uh, into the sculpture itself. After that's done, it goes into the kiln for a bisque, which means that the surface is then hardened, uh, allowing me to, to apply glazes or underglazes. Um, I'll, I'll think about surface, uh, and surface will, will depend on, on, on how I'm feeling that day. It's really expressive. Rather than, than drawing an image, I want to uh, uh, put an expression of how I'm feeling at that moment while I'm making that target. So it could be a splatter of glaze. It could be um, throwing objects at the, at the work. Uh, it could be many forms that, that, that dictate what, what the surface is going to look like. After I'm done applying the glazes, um, the, the sculpture will go into the kiln for a second time. Um, where it will reach temperatures of, of around 2,000 degrees to, to firmly hold that glaze onto the piece and, and get this glass-like surface. The kiln will then open and sometimes I'll be shocked at the results of, of, the, of the glaze. They'll meld together and, 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 and cause uh, different surfaces. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's up to chance but yet um, it depends on how I apply that glaze as to how it will come out. The piece that I'm making right now, the cans specifically, uh, 
stem out of, you know, stem out of a story, an event that happened. But uh, I'm using these water cans. It's a five gallon water jug that, that I used to carry around. Everybody used in the military. It's a very recognizable form. I take that plastic five gallon jug and I make a mold of it, a plaster mold, right? And then you slip cast them. So you have like a liquid clay, it's called slip, right? And it's the same clay body I use sculpturally. It's just a 50-50 talc and ball. But then once I have this plaster mold, I can pour that slip in there and it's, uh, it's a real bastard. I mean, that mold weighs like 150 pounds. But I get, I get the clay form. I fire it, it's bisqued. And then I go through the process of it's almost like comic books, you know? There's going to be a series of these on the wall. They're going to have, like, that first one has this Boy Scout holding the gun. And then it's going to, just going to be talking about identity and identity developing. And so I draw that on there in pencil. I paint it on an underglaze. I fire it, you know, after I've, I wax the figure out. And then I glaze the whole thing with, with it. It's just a low fire clear that I can stain. I, I use a mason stain. The mason is just a brand, but, or Degusa or whatever you want to use. But it's a stain. 5% stain, you know, you color it and you just figure out what kind of colors you're doing. You dump that stain all over it. It's just a real sort of, it's interesting to have that, that thought out, considered drawing surrounded by something that's really messy and, and quick and fast. And so you, you get that and there's, I mean, there's contrast between I don't glaze the figure and that's dry and the glaze is, is clear and glossy and there's a contrast there. You know, the figure, and this is all stuff I teach to my students, right? But the figure's on the third line on the left side or, or you know, odd numbers because odd numbers aesthetically, they're more appealing than even numbers. The even numbers, you have a pattern that's completed. You don't have to think about it. But if you have three of a thing, it's an incomplete pattern. And visually, I'm more engaged by that because I have to... It makes me think, right? Or, or the, the figure, the, the Boy Scout, his head is cropped off. Parts of it aren't there. And so visually, you have to engage with the piece and you have to think about what's on the canvas and what's not on the canvas. But you know, the next one might be, who knows, it might be a little bit older kid. He might have a BB gun. Maybe there's a dead bird. And then, and then maybe he's a little bit older and he's got a shotgun. And maybe he's even a little bit older and he's a soldier now and he has a real gun. But this, this story will progress. And So right now I'm working on a series of pretty big crocs. I start with 25 pounds on the wheel. I call it my war croc series and it's really captivated me. It's really been a, a, a powerful kind of vein that I've tapped into with the vessel. The vessel is talked about in terms of the human body, the lip of the piece, the shoulder, the belly, the foot. And so each one of these pieces to me is me. in the Senate and then you vote in the House and the President makes a speech a committee decides which committee decides which committee decides which committee decides well I'm getting paper cuts and my eyes are bloodshot from watching the tape turn red the Pentagon has too much paperwork to start a real war I wish they'd just send me instead Cause I wanna kill everybody Save the world from hard times I wanna kill everybody And go to jail for atrocious war crimes I want a machine gun that's Big and bulky that shoots and never misses. A nuclear war would be such a bore. I want to meet death and ask, how's the missus? Well, now that the U.S. has bought the war in Nicaragua, I say, why stop there? There's plenty of other countries to obliterate. Playing favorites just ain't fair. And I want to kill everybody Desperate I may be I want to kill everybody Everybody Except me
about them protesters visualizing world peace. Yeah, right, I got your peace right here. There's been four billion wars over Israel, but them bumper stickers inspire me here. And I want to kill everybody, everyone and everything. I want to kill everybody and be When somebody looks at something that I've made, I want them to have a visceral experience with that. I want them to, I want them to feel something. And then later down, whether they're in their car, whether they're walking home, whether it's a week later, a day later, I want them to then think about what they looked at and that feeling they had. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I make has some pretty intense in-your-face imagery, but that's, that's on purpose because I'm just tired of things getting glossed over. When I'm, when I'm sorrowful, when I'm depressed, when I'm sad, and that happens a lot, you know, all the stuff that we've been through as veterans, everything that's happened to us, I think one thing that helps me get through that is that I know I can't fix it and I, that I don't need to. That, um, that that sorrow is just part of who I am. You know, that if I didn't feel sorrowful because I, I shot at people or, or I saw people blown up or bloody, if, I, if that never happened, that same sorrow would be caused by something else. And, I, and it would still exist, but in a different way. I love this country. I would do anything to make this country better. And I think that's why I do the artwork I do is so that my children have a better country, have a better place to live, that, that we, are, we are done fighting over fucking, you know, who's gay marriage, who's this, or who's black, and why this. You know, it, it's, it's about just coming together as a community. In the military, we have Jews, we have blacks, we have Mexicans, we have every religion you can think of, but when we're wearing that uniform, we're all the same. It doesn't matter if, 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 if uh, Joe Blow's uh, gay, I'm still going to help him. That's my job as a medic. You know, it doesn't matter if, if uh, somebody else is, 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 a, is a Muslim in the military. He's still my brother. We're still on the same team and we're, 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 we're working towards the same goal. And that's what needs to happen in, 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 in America. Start. But uh, are we ready? 
Yeah, we're ready. I don't see meat. <laughs> Even better. <laughs>